Pilot, Sorry Mr. About that, John folks. Williams, say a few words. Program crashed. And, uh, I'll say All right. Uh, I couldn't stay in church and not come out here and protest at least one time. You know, I have a purpose here. This is a 150-year-old or more Confederate grave marker. I don't know what that was. All right. I've seen people marching to uh, St. Louis, I think, from Ferguson. And they had people calling them names. They had the KKK out there throwing chicken and whatever else. I would like to be out there spitting on this and see how they like that. Right. You know, this is where America racism started. So, uh, you know, no justice, no peace. No justice, no, no peace. peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Turn that around, Solomon. That's my son, Solomon. All right, turn it around again, baby. All right. What does it say? Everyone, please read that. Slave master and all his overseers still think it's 1800. That's right. And who is the slave master? The government. That's right. The government, the overseer, the overseers is the police officers. You know, this is what I feel. And I hope everybody else picked that up. And I'm out. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Johnny Williams. It's true, though, folks. You know, uh, uh, people have been talking about this recently and building these connections. And, uh, of course, you had the very popular uh, book written by uh, attorney civil rights warrior Michelle Alexander and making the association with the new Jim Crow, right, talking about the uh, mass incarceration system. Uh, I, I, and the uh, prison industrial complex, okay, but it's really true, because you got to take it back even further than that. This shit does go all the way back to slave days because there is an entrenched politic, an entrenched power structure in this country that has never been okay with not having slaves. But has never given up the idea of building their life, building their economic welfare on the backs of others. And the name changes. The name changes and the tactics change. And uh, it ain't sharecropping no more. It's prison labor now. But the game remains the same. And I think that's, that's, that's really important. Because without being uh, dismissive of the newly gained power and the temporary freedoms that we enjoy in this age, what you are seeing happening around the country can be very well characterized as 21st century slave revolts. Right. Yeah. And we've got to understand this. Got, you know, I was just listening to uh, 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 Chairman Bobby Seale. Or the Black Panther Party for some friends. Let's listen to the whole recording to him the other day. And actually, it's interesting. We got uh, we, we got some uh, RCP folk out there. You know, on the, uh, this is an interview he did with Bob Avakian was actually up in the room too. And what they were talking this is from going back like 40 years ago. And what they were talking about is the same damn thing that we're talking about right here. So something's got to change. Uh, I'd like to call up next. Uh, uh, Adriana Camarena doing some work for justice for Alex Nieto. Hi everybody, it's great to see you out here. My name is Adriana. I work with the Justice and Love for Alex Nieto Coalition. Alex was killed on March 21st um, of this year on Bernal Heights in San Francisco. But I'm here to honor O'Shea Nevis. He was killed two months ago today. And I have been extremely fortunate to be in contact with his family almost in the immediate weeks after. And this is what I really want to tell you about. I am incredibly grateful to all the protesters who have come out to the streets in the last weeks for to draw attention to Mike Brown and Ferguson and also in recent days to Eric Garner in New York. But I am incredibly grateful because it has brought attention to the local cases as well. People are asking, what is going on next to me? And if you have a visceral connection to what happened to Mike Brown, and if you have a visceral connection to what happened to Eric Garner, because, man, how can we not when you see a man choke to death in front of your eyes? But I want to thank, I want to 
first of all, thank all the ones, all the families and friends of those who have been taken by police before this year, because they were the first ones who were there for Alex's family. And now I do the same, I hope, for O'Shane Evans. And, and so I want to thank you. And I actually want to name you, because I want you to know the names of those who have died before O'Shane and before Alex. You have Idris Dully. Rest in power. Rest Kenneth power. Harding Jr. Rest in power. Andy Lopez. Rest, Rest in power. Kerry Baxter Jr. Rest in power. Alan Bluford. Rest in power. And Oscar Grant. Rest in power. These are people, who are majority young men who have been killed by police in recent years in the Bay Area. Let me tell you who was killed this year in the Bay Area and in Northern California. Yanira Serrano Garcia. Rest in power. She was killed in Half Moon Bay. Antonio Lopez. Rest, Rest in power. He was killed in San Jose. O'Shea Nevis. Rest in power. Killed the most recently in San Francisco. Errol Chang. Rest, Rest in power. Killed in Daly City. Alex Nieto. Rest in power. Killed in San Francisco. And the Salinas Four, four Latino men killed back to back in Salinas. Their names are Ankel Ruiz, Rest in power. Osman Hernandez, Rest in power. Carlos Mejia, Rest in power. and Frank Alvarado. Rest in power. So again, familiarize yourself with their cases and understand what is, why the injustice is so great. And Tadeen already told you why because of the lies, because they criminalize the victims. That's what they do. They want to taint public opinion so you do not care about the people who are killed by the police. So I used to be like many other people when I heard of a police shooting, maybe in my mind, it crossed my mind. I mean, was it justified or was it not justified? But now that I've been involved in the, with a family and fighting the lies against their children, and I see that there's a script, I tell you, do not believe ever that there was a threat that justified a killing. And do not believe the criminalization of the character of the victims. They are lies. And you just, you can believe that to your core. Because they tell lies. Police tell lies. So again, familiarize yourselves with the case. I'm with the Alex Nieto um, Coalition. and. Frankly, if you want to be part of the Alex Nieto Coalition or the O'Shane Evans Coalition or the Idris Deli Foundation, just say you are. Thank you. And also, man oh man, also, my homeboy Brown, 77th Avenue, for no reason, always used to wear his, um, his, uh, what you call it, what you call it, thing on his side, going to the store every day. It's a little tomahawk. Every day. He went to the store one day on 72nd and he's 14th. And a lady cop came in. And I'm not prejudiced at all. I'm colorblind. But she came in in the store and told him, release your tomahawk. He, and he was like, I'm not releasing shit. I wear this thing every day. Then he even told the owners of the store. They was like, he, he wears this every day. He's a nice guy. But he didn't take his tomahawk off. But then, when he got ready to take it off, finally, after, after the bitch, excuse me, y'all, after the bitch, finally, you know, you know, was like, motherfucker, you don't take your shit off, this and that, blah, 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 blah. He finally got ready to take his tomahawk off. This was a good friend of mine. When he reached for his shit to take it off, the bitch shot him and killed him. She, she could have shot him in the leg or something. She didn't have to shoot the motherfucker in the heart. And that's just, you know, that's just a law. And the law is just, it's fucked up. It's fucked up. It's fucked up. Okay? Kill him for nothing. Thank you, brother. So... I want to acknowledge 
thank uh, first off I want to I want to I want to thank uh, this reason I want to thank uh, uh, Adrian in particular for, for calling out some names because one of the tactics that they use when someone is assassinated by the police oh they know we coming they know we coming even if it's a small group of us they know that we coming and, and they know and, and they know that we and they know that we're bringing it and one of the tactics that they use is they want to wait it out they want to weather the storm. They want to wait till people forget, till the family is alone and isolated. And they'll take two, three years sometimes doing that. Holding on to police reports, holding on to autopsies and coroner's reports, and they'll wait till everything dies down because they think they got a better chance of getting away. So just in case you try to figure out where where you can get in, if you if you if you're new to this struggle and you try to figure out where you can get in, just by being here. Just by letting them know that we are not forgetting these people. And, that, and letting the families know that they are not alone so they have uh, extra courage to continue on this struggle. Because let me tell you, it don't, it don't end. It just begins. It just begins with the assassination. And so, uh, hold on, brother. So, uh, so, Thank you all for that, and thank you, Adriana. There's a few more names that we need to uh, add to this list, and uh, Rebecca Roy-Zlichter from the Eater Stolly Foundation is going to uh, uh, I'll remind you a few more names of, uh, of victims and also let you know uh, what we got coming up next in the program. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so, so often, um, not only are people... Uh, re-victimized by, no, not only our families re-victimized by the police, but us as a movement a lot of times doesn't do right by the people who have been killed by the police. Um, and a lot of that I think is, is true when we talk about the black and brown women who have been murdered by the police, um, especially the black and brown trans women. Yes. Um, often they are, their names are forgotten about. Um, I made one of these signs. We could read the names off of it. Randy Martell. Brandy Martell. Rest in power. Chantel Davis. Rest in power. Tarika Wilson. Rest in power. Eleanor Bumpers. Rest in power. Charmel Edwards. Rest in power. And right here in Berkeley, actually, Kayla Moore was brutalized by the police. Rest in power. Miriam Perry. Rest in power. Anita Gay. Rest in power. Rika Boyd. Rest in power. Yvette Smith. Rest in power. power. Taisha Miller. Rest in power. Rita Elias in Modesto. Rita Elias. Rest in power. Rest in power. Sheila Victoria. Rest in power. Sheila Maya. Rest in power. Your friend. Rest in power. So I want you to keep the powerful spirits of all those women in your hearts tonight. I also, um, want to talk a little bit about black brown solidarity I'm, br I'm glad al brought that up because i don't know if you guys heard that one of the 43 students who was disappeared in guerrero in guerrero was found buried today i believe a lot of people think that's not really connected to what's happening here um but in reality like the criminalization and the devaluing of black and brown lives is a global phenomenon and it's really important for us to keep an international approach to what's happening. Because of colonialism, because of neocolonialism, global exploitation, um, we don't really consider that Mexico is actually closer to us than Ferguson. This used to be Mexico. This used to be Mexico, right? If we really want to talk about looting. <laughs> We want to talk about looting and stealing. Um, a lot of people also don't realize that uh, more enslaved people of African descent were taken to Latin America than the U.S. And that racism is actually something something people st still experience today. So keeping... A lot of people also don't realize that O'Shane was an immigrant. People know that Shane's family's from Jamaica, and his brother. I don't know if Troy's here yet, but um, Troy speaks very eloquently about how the global exploitation of uh, people of African descent is very connected to police murders 
So this isn't just a national struggle, this is an international struggle. We need to keep linking up with other movements. We need to link up with the people here organizing for justice for the students in Guerrero. We need to link up with people organizing for immigrant rights. These are not separate. Um, these are not separate communities. Black people are often immigrants. Latinos are often black. So with that said, um, while, we, while we have those uh, thoughts in our head, I want to do a short little exercise um, before People's Community Medics has their workshop. I have some piece of paper to pass out and some pencils. Can a couple people help me? Can they get maybe two people? We need like, to take half of those pencils. So we have some pens and little pieces of paper going around. Well, hold on. Okay, so we're going to have some pieces of paper and pencils go around. And I want everyone to take I want everyone to take a pencil and a piece of paper and if your neighbor doesn't have a piece of paper, rip yours in half and you could give them you could give them the paper. Okay, so I want everyone to take the piece of paper that you should have in your hand. And does everyone have one? Okay. So I want everyone to take the piece of paper in your hand. I want you to um, rip it in half so you have two small pieces of paper. Not everyone. If you have like, your own paper, flyer, pencils, please feel free to use that as well. Um, now on one piece of paper, I want you to write what keeps you resilient in one word, or possibly two. We're not going to make you read it. This is just for you. On one, on one of the pieces of paper, I want you to write, what keeps you resilient? What, why do you keep coming back to these demonstrations? What's important to you? It could be the name of someone. Ugh, take a short break here, folks. We're out here at Oakland City Hall here at the 12th Street Oakland BART station. Out here for O'Shane Evans. This is your live streamer, Freeman Sullivan. Thanks for joining us. We're going to take a short break here. Uh, there's no scheduled march for this. There's no march for this. Um, there should be more people showing here. I would think at 5. It seems to be the punch the pattern. Oh, I see. So we're just going to take a short. Go to decide whether I'm going to go to a meeting in San Francisco. I know, in, um, I know that in Berkeley at five o'clock there's a demonstration yeah. scheduled for Duran and Telegraph. <laughs> After yesterday. <laughs> So there's going to be a little workshop here, and uh, if you give me a second, uh, when the workshop starts, I'll uh, I'll live stream that as well, I guess. I'm my feet there for about an hour. So we'll go back to what's going on here in just a minute, folks. I have to take a break. So when you're watching Freeman Sullivan's live stream, you have to understand that I'm a disabled guy. And uh, I'm actually very fortunate to be even able to walk. So, count my blessings every day. My son called me up this morning. He said, so I know you were demonstrating yesterday. Were you in Berkeley? And I said, no, I was in San Francisco. And Powell, Park, and Powell. Mm -hmm. I 
Uh, well, we got to, you know, I saw some of the video from last night, and as usual, you know, I don't know what, what, what it is about cops, but, you know, they're firing tear gas at people, and it's illegal under the uh, Geneva Convention to use tear gas, like, in wartime. You know, so what makes them think that they can use it on the public? You know, it's just, you know, shooting at kids with rubber bullets, you know, peeing people. Uh, there was one police officer, it seemed like he was enjoying the fact that he was beating people up, you know? Yeah. Well. I guess they call that, I was reading somewhere, they call that quality stick time, right? You know, so, you know, we're dealing with people, you know, they're fucking sadists to begin with, you know, and we're only, you know, we're only feeding into that sadism, you know, and I, I would say that a goodly number of cops are on steroids, or they're taking some kind of performance enhancing drug while they're on duty. Um, you know, I just don't understand it. Well, 45 years ago, I was working as a clerk in a smoke shop on the corner of Bancroft and Telegraph, right across the street from the Student Union in Ber UC Berkeley. Like that? It was during People's Park <laughs> demonstrations before Governor Reagan brought in the National Guard. So one of the things that the demonstrators were doing in those days, you know, still doing it, like they get newspapers and they start trash can fires. Right? So I was working in, inside the smoke shop and my boss said, oh, I got these rack, rack, big rack of papers, newspapers out of the side. I want you to bring them back inside so that the protesters don't start, start uh, trash can fires. So I go out and grab a whole big, huge armload of papers, bring it back inside, then go outside to, to the racks to get another big armload. And as I've got this second big armload, now the corner of my eye, I see this other Alameda County Sheriff's deputy, otherwise known as Blue Beanie, coming at me with a big nightstick, swinging it over his head and running towards me. So, you know, I didn't have any time time to write a term paper on the best thing to do in, under the circumstances. So I shoved the papers right into his face. Run, run, into, the, run, run into the smoke shop inside and slam the door on his face. And I can see, see it happening because uh, part, part of this door was a, like a four, four, three and a half, four inch reinforced glass, you know, I mean, re reinforced with, with, with uh, this wire mesh. So I, I hit him in the face with it. He's, bang he's still banging on for about 10 seconds onto the, onto the glass door, right? You know, and then he finally, finally gives up and goes off. He figures, you know, I got a beat on this one. He's going to go find somebody else to pick on. Well, that was, that was my... That was my introduction to, to the fact that those, a lot of those cops, they just come swinging and shooting and they don't ask questions ever. Just like, just like Darren Wilson, he'll never question the fact of what he did. Throughout his whole life, he'll figure he did the right thing. That's a good point. There's just too many of those guys, you know? Yesterday I was talking to a, talking to some of the cops over in San Francisco at Market and Powell. I talked to, I told two of them the same story. You know, they, they all they react differently. Some of some one of them said, good for you, you know? And another and another one was really pissed pissed off at me. It just it just varies. But there's too, too many of them that just shoot first. Trigger happy. Go back just a second here, folks. Take a short break. So, so what's happening at three here? Oh, that's when it ends. Oh, I see. And then, and then it, uh, there's something else happening at five o'clock. Five o'clock at Bancroft and Telegraph. Oh, I see. Got it. Over in Berkeley. I won't be making that, folks. Um, if you're watching this live stream, I'll be at. Uh, I'll be at Occupy Toronto, livestream.com, tonight at 7. Uh, we're going to be talking about the case of James Jennison, a uh, live streamer who's in jail right now for felony battery charges. 
as a result of the Black Friday protest in San Francisco. Uh, his hearing uh, for supervised pretrial releases tomorrow morning at 8.50 Bryant, Department 9 at 9 a.m. So if you can come, do come. Um, I'll be live streaming after the hearing to let everybody know exactly the deposition of his case thus far. So uh, we're going to be talking about that on uh, Occupy Toronto tonight. So that's Dee Shanger's show from Toronto. Uh, do join in and, and uh, that'll be at 7 p.m. Uh, uh, Pacific Standard Time. So you get started a little bit late on the East Coast there. Uh, well, Toronto's not the East Coast, but on Eastern Standard. It's 10 Eastern Standard Time, 7 Pacific. So uh, do log in for the chat because uh, that's where most of the action is at the Occupy Toronto live stream. So we're going to be talking about how to legally protect yourself. Uh, first thing I got to say that if you're really serious about doing live streams, uh, you really should start wearing press pass. Uh, that's the first step. Uh, you can even make your own press pass. Up. You don't have to get one from the police to be a member of the working press. Trust me on that. Um, and then the second thing is, is to keep a lawyer. Yeah, if you want, they don't issue real ones in San Francisco. You know, it's like you have to, uh, uh, they're very stingy with them. Uh, if you're like a person like myself who covers uh, protests and things like that, they won't even issue you. So uh, she even said it to me, uh, the sergeant, smart ass sergeant. So uh, uh, as opposed to a place like DC, where it only costs $10 to get a press pass and anybody can do it. So we're going to be talking about that. Um, also, uh, I'd recommend keeping a lawyer or having a lawyer friend, or somebody who can keep you in a bail bondsman. Um, that'll keep you out, you know, they can bail you out. Uh, because sometimes you're going to be caught up in a demonstration and the police really aren't going to care who they arrest. So uh, that's always a good idea. So, fortunately, through my many years of legal advocacy for medical cannabis patients and other people uh, arrested under questionable circumstances, um, I have made it a point to uh, befriend a lot of criminal defense attorneys. So, unfortunate in that regard. Never hurts to know too many lawyers. So let's check on the chat here, see who's talking. Hey, thank you there, General Bear. Um, also, I'd like to let people know, uh, not only for this live stream, but for all of my live streams, um, if something goes down and there's no reason that's given for it, um, and I'm not signing off, I'll stick with the live stream, and I will sign off at a certain point when either I'm tired of live streaming or the event is over or so on and so forth. And I will say, I will sign off. But since we have such a lot of uh, since we have so many viewers today, I'm going to stick with the live stream here as long as I can. Oh, I do have extra battery. And we've got a small group of people. But this is different in that we actually have people friends and the family of people here who were murdered by police. Oh, just a minute here, I'll go right back. Oh yeah, I, me too. <laughs> no. Good to see you. All right, good to see you too. My name's Clark, by the way. Lucy Marie. Nice to meet you. What's your name? Clark. Art. Clark. Clark. Lucy Marie. See you around. All right, take care. All right, we're gonna walk back over. Andy Lopez was guilty of carrying a toy gun 
in a field near his home while being brown. Tamir Rice was guilty of carrying a gun, a toy gun, I'm sorry, a toy gun at a playground while being brown. That's the story. Alan is special and his story is unique and special. At the same time, we've heard it over and over and over. And that's why we're all here, because we're tired of it. Today, especially, on the two-month anniversary of O'Shane Evans being taken from us so violently, so horribly, I am so sad for what I know his mother and his sister and his brother and all the rest of us are going through at the loss of his life, at the loss of Oscar's life, at the loss of Alex's life, Alan's life, Ernest's life, Kenny's life. We're all suffering at those losses. And I'm going to share something with you all. It's going to be just a real quick repeat after me. Just recently, I went to jail again for protesting against the police killing black and, black and brown people with impunity for not being held accountable for it. I was really scared to go back because the first, you know, the last time before that I went, they hurt me. And I was scared the, that they were going to hurt me again. They hurt me because they want to send a message to me. They want to send a message when they hurt other people who are here protesting. They want to send a message. And yeah, it hurt and I was scared, but I got my eyes on the prize because what I thought is I'm protesting because they killed a black man. They killed a brown man. They've killed a brown child. They have killed a black child. And the law says that's okay. So I was really, really scared to go to jail the last time especially because I thought that they weren't going to be too happy about the whole shutting down BART on Black Friday and all that. I thought they might try to send a stronger message this time. So I, 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 was, I thought I might be going away for a while. I won't lie, I was really scared. And Alicia Garza, who's co-founder of the Black Lives Matter Coalition, because they really do matter. We do matter. No matter what color our skin is, Black lives matter, brown lives matter, all of our lives matter because we got to use all of our lives to help fight to put an end to state-sponsored murder by police. So Alicia Garza, when we're all sitting there in the BART police headquarters there, which ironically we rode BART to with the police, when we're sitting there in the headquarters and I'm kind of thinking, this is really ironic. It's a bunch of black people with these shirts on, all the same message, and then police, and that's all of us on the bar train, and then all of us in this room. And when I really thought I'm about to start to lose it here because I'm so scared, Alicia Garza led us through a chant, and I want y'all to repeat it with me now. It is our duty to fight. It's our duty to fight. It is our duty to win. It's our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight. It is our duty to fight. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight. It is our duty to fight. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We have we must love and support each other. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. I love y'all. Thank you. Thank you. And is there anyone else here who'd like to speak who hasn't put up the mic yet? All right, thank, thank you all. Thank, excuse me, brother. Excuse me, excuse me, brother. Uh, all right, thank you very much. I want to also, I want to, I want to point out here, as you just heard, we, uh, so, some of y'all were out there for the park shutdown, but the Onyx Organizing Committee and the, uh, 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 the, the, the Black and Brown Lives Matter Coalition, and, and these folks have been laying it down heavy here out, out in Oakland, 
uh, and in the city, and so I want to give some love. Actually, Kat from Onyx was supposed to be emceeing here today. She had a family matter to attend to, so that's why y'all got stuck with me. But, uh, but, but I want to give mad, uh, give, give mad love. Uh, I want to let y'all know we had some more families uh, uh, come up as we've been going here. And so uh, right now, all the way from Florida, I want to bring up the family of Kendra Johnson. Jordan! Jordan, Kendra Jordan, excuse me. Uh, uh, I'm Uncle Bobby, affectionately known to the community, Oscar Grant's uncle, but I'm not going to speak right now. I'm definitely going to pass. Oh, I'm going to pass the. I'm going to pass the mic to my sister Jackie and her husband Kenneth, who is a parent of Kendrick Johnson, the young man in Valdosta, Georgia, that was murdered in the school that allegedly, supposedly, had crawled into a mat suffocated himself to death and then took his own internal organs out and uh you know and, and, and history goes on the lies that have been told and perpetrated across this country but anyway here's the thank you good evening my son was 17 years old he went to school with a book bag and he came out in a body bag I'm going to let you know, this this thing, what's going on in this world, it's real. My son went to school and got killed, got beat to death in school, and nothing has been done. January the 10th will be two years, and my son has been gone. Nobody's in jail, nobody, I see the clothes, the cage, they don't want to do anything about it because their football team is so, such a big football team. Life don't matter down there. My son should have been home with us. We don't have to go Christmas and his birthday and everything without him. They told us my son fell into a mat trying to retrieve a shoe. But I know my son, my son would have never got up in no mat to get no shoe. He'd have pushed mat, them mats down on the ground and got his shoe and went on the class. But they said that uh, he was trying to get a shoe and he suffocated and died. But we all know that he was beat to death. Kendrick was a three-sport athlete. He played football, basketball, and he ran track. So you're going to tell me my son was just lay there in a mat and suffocate? How many people have heard about the Kendrick Johnson story? That story is real. We're his parents and we go through this every day. We need to stand and support as one and unity. United we stand. If we stay divided, we're going to always fall. We need the help of the people to put, help push our stories, help tell our story. Yeah. Tell somebody about Mike Brown. Tell somebody about the baby that just got killed the other day. Tell somebody about these stories. We need to make something happen. We got to get on the ball because they kill, the cops are killing every day and they got a life in the kill a badge to hide behind kids ass we uh exhumed his body a couple of months after he died they took all my son's organs they took his brain his soul his windpipe every organ from the top of his head so his pelvis was missing they even stole his clothes he didn't even have we couldn't even find his clothes after he came back from the crime lab if it was no murder, I mean, if it was just an accident, what they ruled it as, then why are all his organ missing, all his clothes gone? What, what for? What for? So, Kendrick, as we um, get on the road and we travel and tell people about our story, and a lot of people haven't even heard about our story. We got people that's going all out the country, but we got stories and stuff need to be heard and need to be pushed right down here in Georgia, about off the Oakland, right down here in the United States. Uh, I'm just going to kind of fill in some details so that you understand uh, this connection. Kendrick, their son, allegedly was involved in a fight. Or we'll just say it was a fight. However, what I'm getting to is that the individual he had a fight with, father, was an FBI agent. And the, and the children involved in his murder, one is also the son of a sheriff. So we have the school as culpable for allowing them to splice up the film that showed what happened when he went into the gym, who was involved in beating him, and then not only that, the, the internal organs, as you know, as she stated, were missing. His fingernails were cut off, and they couldn't even retrieve his clothes, and that's so that the DNA evidence that we can actually secure to help identify this murderer is hidden from us as a community. So not only is the school culpable and the police department culpable, but even the FBI. 
You hear what I'm saying? And this family could have elaborated much more on details that would astonish us and even piss us off according to what's happening by them simply sending their son to school with a backpack and then him being sent home in a body bag. You know, I'm, I'm just gonna move forward for a minute and talk a little bit about what's going on in, in our recent visit to Ferguson and what transpired there. We were part of the five malls that were shut down in Ferguson. I mean, it was tremendous. And it really added a psychological, uh, a motivational increase in the fact that we actually seen some victories take place. But not only the five malls, two Walmarts and a Target. I'm talking about when I say shut down, completely shut down. Completely shut down. Yeah. You know, and I want to add this. You know, we're talking about body cam. If the body cams, as we know, hopefully is added, it's a right, it's a step in that direction, but it's not an end all to this issue that we're dealing with. Because we have to be clear that just because we had the body cams and it can show what happened, as we saw what happened, Oscar, Rodney King, Marlon Brown, I can go on the names. We got a DA that'll tell you what you're seeing is not what you see. And so if by chance we get past the D DA, we got to deal with a prosecuting attorney, as we know, is not going to represent the family against a police officer, his friend, to the fullest. But if by chance we get past the DA, now we got to deal with the jury that has been so uh, desensitized and so overwhelmed with white, white, with white racism, or uh, well, I should say white supremacy, that many of us don't even know that we're harboring these, these internalized biases to render a verdict that is not just. And, I was, and if by chance, let me just say this, if by chance we can get past the jury, then we got judges that we know that are overturn what the jury does. Yeah. I'm going to say two quick cases of what I'm talking about, the level of wrongs that we see throughout this racist criminal justice system. Ramali Graham case in New York, basically was going on for what, a year and a half? Just for the judge to throw the case out because the, the uh, district attorney purposely filed an incorrect motion. And he threw the case out. That's on the district attorney level. But the jury in our case came back with a guilty verdict on the gun enhancement charge, which is an automatic 10 years. But they also came back with a guilty verdict of involuntary manslaughter, which is two years. The minimum he was supposed to do was 12 years. But Judge Robert Perry claimed he erred with his instructions to you, took the gun enhancement off the table, then gave him a day served for each day in jail, reduced his time to 11 months so that he wouldn't have to go to prison, and that's what he did. So it was not a victory. It was just historical. You know. But I have to say that we are indebted to you, the community. As I've always said, and we'll always repeat this, that had it not been for you standing with us, crying with us, going back and forth to court with us, allowing us to lean our head on your shoulders as we cry, and utilizing your First Amendment right to speak to that very injustice of what happened to Oscar Grant was tremendous. And it was because of you that we were able to get the first time in California state history an officer charged, arrested, convicted, and sent to jail. So we thank you for that. I am. I am. We really thank you for that. That is so critical. And so these families that you've heard speak, Dion, the Kendrick Johnson family, the O'Shane family, and all, I'm sorry, the O'Shane Evans family, and all these families that don't have videos, all these families that nobody seemed to talk about on a national level Billy. are real people that are suffering the same pain we suffered. So it's our hope, as the community embraced us and loved us, that you embrace them, you love them, and you support them. And when Jeanne make a call out, if we can get the stock and get the stock, then support her. 
Wherever we go in our conversation, if we're not in Atlanta or Georgia, we talk about the Kendrick Johnson family and what happened to their son. And today, right here in the whole Bay Area, right now, with this family that is here today asking for the support and the help, we definitely want you to embrace them, love them, and stand with them. Because that is the only way this family will have a right and hopefully get some form of justice. So I want to bring up Angela, the dear mother of our young brother who, as recently as we know, was murdered by these rogue racist police here in the state of California, in San Francisco. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yay! As you all know, I'm the mother of Shane Evans, who was taken away on the 7th of October. Today makes two months since he's been gone. Every morning, every day, every hour, every minute, I think about my child, 26 years old, never leave home, mom is born. It's just so hard. My, my heart is just broken. And on top of that, to see all these other parents out there who is going through the same thing as what I'm going through. But my blessings to all of you. We have to stay strong. And ask the Lord to give us the strength each day to go on and to fight this battle because we are on a battlefield right now. And we are fighting for her rights, for her justice. And justice will prevail. That's my words. Thank you. So, um, before this die down, I want to do some chants and um, get this going. Because I want him to know if I don't get no justice, they'll never get peace out of me. And they can take a picture and write it down. Remember my face. If I don't get no justice, they'll never hold a terrorizing city and every other city I go in. I will terrorize it. So remember my face. Look at it. Take it down. Write it down. Take a picture. Remember me. No justice. No peace. 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 What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Now. What do we want? Now. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. to do something for these families. Those that celebrate Christmas, not all of us do, but if you do, at your dinner table, have a seat empty and a plate in that vacant spot representing O'Shane, Kendrick, some family member that is missing because of this heinous act of this system and killing black and brown lives. And when you do that, I want you to tweet it out. Make this a national tweet that will go viral so every home, every family can see the pain that we suffer every holiday without our loved one at that table with us. So on that day, again, take that position, show your love, have that seat, that plate, and if you have a picture of that loved one that you want to share with the world, set it there and tweet it out, put it on Facebook. Let's put this in everybody's visual so that they can know that there's people and families out here suffering because of these holidays and the pain that we've experienced with this unjust system. Thank you, Uncle Bobby. We go one minute? One minute. All right, Brother Man's got something to say here. One minute. Damn. And it's kind of hard. Anybody know anything about Thomasinus Church? Anybody? Nobody know about Thomasinus, huh? That's faith. You know who goes to that church? Thank you, baby. Thank you. I go to I, I go to Pharmacy's church. I'm a member, and I just want to say, you know, God. Let us all pray for Oscar Grant.
man, we didn't do nothing. Man, that's probably all I hear now because of shit like that. They had him cut, pinned to the ground, face to the ground, show it on TV, and they beat him like a dog and killed him. I go, hey, I am a member of Palmasia. I love you for saying you know. Somebody, at least somebody out here know. Okay, thank you, man. I think that's important because we can take that message. That's actually a real good message. We can take what we're hearing today, what we're feeling today, what we're saying today. We, you don't just have to be a police accountability community. We can take this to our communities outside of here, to our workplaces, to our churches, to our places of congregation, to our dinner table, as Uncle Bobby said. We can't let this get boxed in because that's their tactic. That's their strategy. Divide and conquer. We need to make sure that this remains part. This will always be part of our lives and no one knows that better than the families or the victims. But we got to make sure that it is always part of our lives as well. Uh, I want to turn the mic over to Anita Welsh. She's got a few words for you. Hi, everybody. Fuck the police! Fuck the police! Fuck the system! 
the police. Fuck the police. Fuck the police. Fuck this system. Fuck this system. I'm in my fucking country. I'm not in their country. You know? It's a shame that Russia looks better, looks more democratic than America right now with what the shit, what the shit that's going on here. And, and they're talking about us all over the world. You know, people are putting up their hands and in Korea, in North Korea, in, in uh, Japan, London, in Canada, all over the world. They're putting up their hands in support of us and our murdered loved ones. And I did, and I do have an organization called the Inner Council for Mothers and Murdered Children. And the reason being that I want the mothers to have a voice. I want the mothers to be able to sit around and talk and not feel like they're going to be intimidated because they're talking after their child was murdered. We don't know. I didn't know my grandson was going to be murdered that night. I did not know. And I was as conscious as I could be before that. And I'm very conscious now. And I'm not going nowhere. You know, just like Kadeem just said, I'm not going nowhere. I'm going to be up in their faces until they put me six feet under. And I hope you guys feel the same. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. You know, one of the points that uh, uh, Sister Anita just brought up is uh, the struggle for people that are behind enemy lines, right? The struggle for people that are incarcerated, because that's one of the other sides of this. And uh, uh, I want to, I want to throw it, I want to throw it out there that uh, we are here today demanding justice for O'Shane Evans, who was killed on October 7th of this year in San Francisco. I want to point out, the four days before O'Shane was killed by San Francisco Police Department, Antoine Malenko was killed inside San Francisco County Jail at 8.55. And you're going to be hearing more of that name because we're working on that and we're going to be coming out and you're going to be learning more in the days to come. The family is fighting. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here today. But I want you all to remember that that's another side of this. They don't stop on the street. And it don't stop on the inside, it's all around. So we're going in solidarity with our people behind enemy lines. There's also the court side, and I want to let you know uh, about uh, something going on starting tomorrow. Hernan Jaramillo, who was killed by the OPD, that the Oakland Police Department, Oakland Organized Killers, in July of 2013, Hernan Jaramillo was killed by OPD. Court hearing starts, the federal court hearing starts tomorrow at the San Francisco Federal Building at 450 Golden Gate, 1.30 p.m., room number 12 on the 19th floor. So if you could come out and show court support for that family, the family of Hernan Jaramillo, killed by OPD in July of last year. Again, 1.30 tomorrow, SF Federal Building, 450 Golden Gate, room 12, 19th floor. All right, uh, um, we got the, the, the people's community medics here for a mini train. We got it together, and so I'd like to bring them up right now. They're doing amazing community work, uh, uh, letting us know if we are on the front lines, how we can help heal and save each other's life. Listen. Here, all thousand people! All okay, right, well, I gotta let, let that go, unfortunately, folks. Justice for Ocean Evans! Anyway, uh, I'll be on Occupy Toronto tonight, talking about live streamer safety, and uh, we're going to say goodbye here from Oakland. Um, I will be up and running tomorrow at approximately 10 a.m. Uh, to give you a report about what happens with James Jennison's uh, at Code Frame SF. His case, uh, facing charges for felony battery. Anyway, much love and much peace to you all, and have a great Sunday. Bye-bye.